the challenge was no, no tears, you said. I think. No, no, just, I think we've agreed I'm there's going to be tears. I've just felt a huge um, welling up, like a, th a lump in my throat, because it is the most isolating experience um, I ever lived through. The lived experience of a woman trying to conceive and not managing is super isolating. And it is really the one thing that I think you need to cling on, even right now, with all the anxiety that builds up between scams. Hope gives before. you courage. Hope gives you courage, and other women can give you courage also. And I think it's, I would, I would encourage anyone to speak now. There are billions of women passing through similar experiences all around the world, and for whatever reason, we often feel like we're alone. It's time to make a point of discussing these topics from a range of viewpoints. Women in the workplace, fertility, the menopause, women's rights, social media, sexuality, body image, politics, relationships, parenting, age, and women in their role today. These conversations surpass age, race, location. They are relevant to women everywhere. Welcome to The She Word, conversations that women rarely have, but really should. For those willing to change the world one step at a time. For those dreaming of sustainable living. For those striving to find a healthier balance. For those always believing. Browns and Viridian. Love the planet, love yourself. Welcome to The She Word, conversations that women rarely have but really should. And today's conversation is about fertility and making babies. And I'm really excited to have Maxine Attard as one of our guests, the co-founder of Days of Sunshine, but also a woman who touched tens of thousands of women recently when she shared her story of miscarriage. I'm also joined by Karen Schranz, who also shared her journey of fertility and spoke out to so many women across Malta. I'm also joined by Dr. Elena Zarb, who is here as a pharmacist, but also as a mother and someone who really knows about the subject. Here's the challenge for this show. I am fairly sure, based on previous experiences, that there's going to be some tears around the table. <laughs> Because every time we've spoken about this, it is an incredibly emotive topic. And so I'm preparing myself and to choose us somewhere. Oh, they good. Because I, I, so. <laughs> I was going to ask. I was going to ask. I messaged my friend saying, I hope I'm not going to cry. <laughs> I, 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 cry. Think, I think we've pretty used to actually use a given. And because, of course, every woman uh, expects at some point in their life that they're going to have a journey of, of fertility, of having babies of, of being a mum and particularly as you said Karen previously in, in interviews that was really your main objective in life was to be a mum so of course it's a motive for everybody all women think that's going to happen to them and um, I want to not preempt that but I want to ask you about your journeys it, as well as for you, Elena, as well, because you are also a mum. And I'm going to start with you, Karen. Tell just in brief what your journey is, because we're going to touch on that a little bit later on as well. Um, like you said, my goal in life, one of my goals, but it's like I think one of the goals of many, of of, of everyone, when we're little children, we grow up having these. Um, expectations out of life one of them is having a family one of them is a career and one of them is finding a partner in, for for life so but my expectation was huge like i really wanted to be a mum that was all i ever dreamt about and um we started trying straight away but um my journey took a bit long it was we had we finally conceived after 15 years in the meantime we adopted after 10 years and um, then Lily came along five years later so and we had um, rounds and rounds of fertility treatment um, for nothing but anyway eventually we finally managed so because you when you've spoken about this before you were told that you had unexplained infertility and you found after 15 years that there's no such thing as unexplained infertility if you look deep enough there's always a reason there must be a reason that it's not happening so after 15 years you were able to find 
the the reason. And so, you can tell me just a little bit about that because you'd you'd been trying for fifteen years. You'd you'd adopted in the meantime, as you mentioned, and then after fifteen years, you found a solution to why you couldn't get pregnant. So. Um the doctor we visited in, in the UK um, told us that there's no such thing as unexplained. The problem is probably within the immune system because that's so vast and it can be so hard to identify what the problem is when it's to do with the immune system, when everything physically is okay. And um, we did some blood tests and we identified that David and I were too compatible. I'm not recognizing, my body is not recognizing his sperm as a foreign body. So when you create an embryo, you create what's called a blocker around it to protect the embryo um, from your immune system. But since I'm not recognizing David as a foreign body, I'm not creating that blocker. And then further down the line, when um, the embryo tries to implant into my uterus, um, there the, Im the immune system's a bit more sensitive and there I'm recognizing it so then I was killing it so I was probably getting pregnant every time but um, killing the baby before it had time to implant into my uterus so probably you know within a few days of, of conception I was um, miscarrying every time and when that was found out when that that issue was found out you actually went through quite a lot of a, a medical um process to be able to become pregnant we had to we had to i had to take um blood serum from another man to create a huge allergic reaction in my body and um and david gave his blood to the wife of another couple anyway and um basically it was about 40 subcutaneous um, injections on, on both arms and they had to become huge huge massive welts the bigger the better because it meant my my body was creating more of an allergic becoming super super sensitive and um, and then after the th we had to do that three months in a row and then they tested my blood and they said I was ready to give it a go and since I was 41 um, we did IVF I only had one egg this time because of my age so they said your chances of conception are still really low because of your age I, less than six percent the embryo that was created was not even a healthy embryo um, I will it was a healthy embryo but it didn't look like it was dividing well and they said you know don't we should put you down on the egg donor list but let's just give it two weeks and see what the outcome is and sure enough I was pregnant Amazing. <laughs> so and I was 42 and I had Lily and I started trying at 26, so it was quite That's a long. incredible. It That's quite a long. Absolutely incredible. And a beautiful, Jenny. beautiful story. I think it's so important that you're sharing your story because... I also grew up as the girl who always wanted children and, you know, always thought I'd be a mom. And I didn't know that it wasn't just something that can just happen, yes. you know, so I... Everyone expects it to it, happen. It, yeah, I mean, there are loads of women who don't want to have children and that's great, good, fine. But I, as Maxine, was just besotted and always have been with children. So I think it's so important that if you, when you start your fertility journey, there is some awareness because I can't imagine how you felt going through all that and and it must be it must have been really tough whereas if when people listen to your story and if they happen to be going through something similar it might just be oh look i'm not alone you know i don't know i i personally prefer to be not alone in well in statistically situations. one in five women have issues with fertility and one in four women have issues with miscarriage which yeah. is your story yeah. that you shared very very recently yeah. this year mm -hmm. which of course touched so many yeah. women's lives so i want to hear a bit of that story because sure. once you get pregnant you expect that that's going to happen but one in four women don't no. keep that and in an actual fact the statistic is supposed to be much much higher because as you said you might not even know that you've miscarried exactly. and we'll come to the the, yeah. the pharmaceutical and the medical side of that in just a second but w share your story again. my my journey is we got married and we said okay we'll start trying for a baby and after a few months maybe three or four months we got pregnant so i was 
ecstatic. I can't even tell you how happy I was. And it was so surreal and magic and never, even for a second, did I think, you know, something could go wrong. Um, until I went to my first scan at, I believe it was just seven weeks, a little bit earlier than usual. I think they one of the first scans is at eight weeks. So I went at seven weeks. Um, and I was so anxious on the day, I can't explain why. And I look back now and I think, I wonder if somehow I, it sounds a bit woo-woo to say, but I knew maybe, I don't know. But I had a dreading feeling rather than excitement. And But everything seemed to be okay. There was a heartbeat. We saw this tiny little, really tiny, at seven weeks, tiny little thing on the, on the screen, a very serious uh, scenario. Um, they found a, a blood clot, but they said it's very common, so nothing to worry about. Although me, nothing to worry about. And there I am Googling <laughs> it five seconds later, so I was super worried about it. But it all seemed to be okay. Um, I went on progesterone pills, which would help support the pregnancy, and I carried on. I even traveled. I got the go-ahead to travel. There was really, I just carried on life. I went to the gym. I did everything. I mean, no one told me not to, and there was no reason not to. And then we had the second scan just after 12 weeks. Um, had come back from Christmas holidays. Did, again, very anxious about the scan. Don't ask me why. I was super anxious, crying, the whole works. And sure enough, the ultrasound shows up and this this embryo did not grow so I was n I already knew so I'm lying on the bed and uh, there was a bit of silence and the poor doctor was <sighs> sighing and you can tell like the room just goes a bit tense and I was like the baby didn't grow and he said no and there's no heartbeat and I was just like oh my god and it's not I can't explain how I thought I knew that 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 was gonna happen I I really can't explain I obviously burst out crying, freaking out. But the first thing I said was, I was so unaware of what was what was to come and what the procedure was that I was like, oh, I have to have that procedure. Because once in my whole life, I had heard of somebody had a miscarriage and had to have a procedure. So that's that's what it was in my head. I have to have this now. And, you know, I sort of went into whole panic mode. Um, and then you know, I wasn't in the state of mind to, to, to ask questions. I, you know, I just wanted to go home and crawl in my bed and not move. So it was devastating, to say the least, because I, we had already planned so much. I, I didn't buy anything or anything like that, don't get me wrong. But there is, you, I became a mother straight away, I felt, you know, and I was, I knew the, the day that my best friend was also pregnant at the same time. I was like, how exciting. We're like a day apart. It's a summer baby. There was all of this. I was super excited. So it's, it's, it's a, a new level of heartbreak, I think, that we, we both went through, myself and my husband. So, yes, that's my experience from last January. Um, uh, I can happily say I'm pregnant again. <laughs> so now it's a very different experience and I feel very blessed to be pregnant so soon. I have to say I was very in awe of my body. I, uh, my period came after a month. I got to go ahead to start trying after three months. I, 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 we did start trying without even thinking about it too much. And then now being pregnant again is a whole other kettle of fish, I have to say, because being pregnant post miscarriage is very scary. At least it is for me. Obviously, I, it goes without saying we're all talking about our individual stories here, so I can't generalize. But in my case, I'm 17 weeks now and I am very anxious. I'm seeking help for my anxiety as well. Every scan is like some marathon. I feel like I have to prepare for it and I'm a state and then I feel so exhausted and relieved after when everything's okay. So again, the idea I had in my head as a child of pregnancy of all this has not yet really been that picture. No, it's been a bit different now. But I think now I'm doing my best to try to relax to try to enjoy it to try to be excited to speak about it you know i wouldn't have said anything a few weeks ago i was I've been too scared to say it so you know sometimes when you go through a loss you i feel so scared to to celebrate now because i'm scared if, if it happens again but i think i'm in the frame of mind where i can either live miserably from now to when the baby arrives or i can celebrate it and you know deal with it if something has to happen it has to happen
we know that it is incredibly common for to have fertility challenges and we also know that the miscarriage they say uh, that there's a percentage but it's probably much much higher than we know so if that's the case if it's quite likely that most couples are going to experience some sort of challenge, why don't we talk about it? Because as far as I know, it's not something, well, I mean, from both conversations with both of you, it's not something that people talk about. It's not something that you were told about before you became pregnant. And I remember you saying before, why don't we talk about it? Why don't we talk about it to children? Why don't, you know, why is it not acceptable? Mm hmm I mean, I, I, now I think, well, well, is it better to be ignorant? I don't know. Sometimes ignorance is bliss, but I don't believe that this is one of those occasions. Um, I still haven't quite put my finger on where and when is the right time to discuss it. When should we start learning about it? Somehow, I find somehow it so much um, emphasis is placed on not getting pregnant, like preventing pregnancy as um, teenagers, maybe, and because it's 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 made to seem like you know if you do something you're gonna get pregnant. So that then when you do start trying, you automatically assume it's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. So maybe if it's um, spoken about in a way that you know you can get pregnant if you'd have unprotected sex or you know i don't know you know couples need to know that it is also a possibility that it's not going to happen and it's not going to be easy mm -hmm. because um it's so devastating that even if it's just for a few months it's devastating when you're trying I, I remember in my case, I found the first two or three years the hardest, and then kind of I learned how to manage my pain in a better way. But for the first few years, every month was like a cycle of hope, despair, hope, despair. And it's um, you do suffer from PTSD, even though I have a child now speaking about it. I have three children, but I mean, as, a, as in I've been through pregnancy. Um, speaking about it, I still get really emotional. The pain somehow that um, I experience is still stored within my body. And it, when I do give it um, a voice, I feel the tears welling up really quickly. So it's, um, I, I kind of went from what you asked to a completely different subject. But I think perhaps that women should know that it doesn't necessarily happen just like you know when you have unprotected sex because i remember when we were at Khan at the pre-marriage courses the the person who was speaking to us was telling us one in four one one couple in every four couples here yeah, will have difficulty conceiving and we're all looking at each other like it's not gonna be me it's not gonna be me as if it's not gonna be me you know because we've tried well shouldn't say about pre various sex <laughs> my mom's probably listening to this but you know you had spent so much time trying not to conceive that um anyway so Yes, I really, I think I really, really agree. I think to a certain level of teaching, maybe perhaps when you're in your teens at school, that you know, once you're learning about pregnancy, that I don't know, it should just be a, part of it. absolutely and miscarriage as well, and however. So I think maybe I'm not trying to go into all the scary details at uh, 13, but maybe to touch up don't on the subject. Don't take it for granted. Yeah, because then you are not so devastated or disappointed. Absolutely. You know, it's it's it is. Um, Maybe it doesn't a blessing. Be like, why, it's a is gift, this you know? why is this happening to me? I can imagine so many questions. I, and I, I, I have to say, we were lucky enough to get pregnant relatively quickly both times. But the few months in between, there were moments of extreme disappointment because you try to conceive, then you have the two week wait, which is the time in between conception, hopefully, and your period, which feels like a lifetime. And then. You do it, I mean, in my case, I was doing tests all the time, you know, and really uh, this. And then once I remember <laughs> I one of the tests changed and it, it became a cross because of um, evaporation. And I was like, look, look, it is, it is. We're not really excited. And then sure enough, my period comes. And yes, you have to find the, the coping mechanisms to move on. And I remember a couple of months being very upset. And once I just said enough, I can't. This might take long and I can't do this to myself every month. This crying and obviously the hormones with your period don't help. No, no, it was really tough. So I feel like if there's a slight awareness, perhaps 
you don't feel so alone in in what's happening. Well, you just mentioned about feeling alone because we're talking about a subject that affects every woman. Every woman, every woman at some point is going to talk about whether or not she wants to have children, whether or not she can have children, whether or not she can keep children. It's going to come into every single woman's conscious thought at some point. And yet it's one of those conversations that we don't have. And that's exactly why we're having this conversation right now, because I can only imagine if you are trying for a child and you cannot conceive, or if you lose a child, how incredibly lonely that is. Now, from what I also understand, and it's a question more than anything else, do you feel like it's something that women can talk to about each other, do you, to, to each other. Did you feel like, let's ask you, Karen, did you feel like when you were going through that process of 15 years wanting to have children, you had two amazing children who you adopted, but did you feel like you were able to chat about it? Did you feel there was anybody that, that, that you could really just say, hey, you know what, this is really bloody crap? Okay, um, you, the challenge was no, no tears. You said I think no, no. Just, I think we've agreed there's going to be tears. I've just felt a huge um, welling up, like a, th a lump in my throat, because it is the most isolating experience um, I ever lived through. And the lived experience of a woman trying to conceive and not managing is super isolating, because um, yes, there are people who understand, or like. I think the only person who is going to understand is someone who's living through a similar experience. Everyone else is going to try and make you feel better and say stuff that is well-meaning, but doesn't make a difference, doesn't help you, doesn't make you feel better. The only thing that will make you feel better is getting pregnant, having a baby. So um, no matter how well-meaning people are, but like, you know, it will happen, relax, go on holiday, have some wine or don't think about it how can you not think about it when it's all consuming it's the only thing that you're breathing you know when you want and and also you start feeling like a bit of a burden because you start feeling I used to feel I don't want to talk to my friends about this because they have kids and I don't want them to feel sorry for me I don't want them to pity me I don't want to be um, the person that let's not talk about our kids because there's scarring around. So, um, no, it's very isolating. You kind of withdraw and we, we stopped hanging around with anyone who had kids because first of all, it's, it was painful. Secondly, I didn't really want to hear about that all the time. And thirdly, I, I was, I, I didn't feel shamed. I had no um, problem talking about it with anyone. I'm I'm very open. I'm an open person, and I I absolutely feel no shame about it. But I used to feel, um, you know, it was just too much too much of a um, like a moaning or grumbling all the time, and I'd cry. So I we started hanging around with David's younger brother, who is who wasn't married, didn't have kids, and you know, out of all that, we did have blessings because we had a. 10 year honeymoon <laughs> period <laughs> so whereas everyone was having kids and struggling and being at home we had our 30s you know being able to go out and party and and you know so there was a, a positive side to it it wasn't all bad and we were happy we it wasn't like we lived pain every day but there was pain as part of us I went off track. I can't remember. No, not the you're, question. You're right on track. But Max, you know, we spoke about this as well. Did you feel, after you had your miscarriage, did you feel like you could talk to your friends about it? Did you feel like there was a, that it was an acceptable thing to talk about, or did you feel that, like, like Karen's just said, you know, maybe friends didn't want to hear you talking about it? No, I'm, I'm lucky enough to say I had very, very close knit group of friends and family but I didn't I didn't speak about it um, I think I I would speak mainly to my husband and to anyone else who asked me I was just I guess I'm doing okay or I'm just having a bad day I wouldn't go into all the detail of you know if there was an event happening at dinner and I was just like I, I can't go um, then I'd say you know guys I'm not up to it but it was very tough I had a friend of mine as I said pregnant exactly the same time 
So the pain was there, and she was very aware of it. And I never shun away from telling her as well. And if we had a dinner together, I'd tell her, you know, I might cry. Because I was always petrified of seeing her bump. Because I'd always think, ah, we, we're exactly the same. So that was super painful. And she felt that too. But we cried together. You know, I made sure she came over, bless her, with, a, with food. And we just sat there crying. And I, she would message me constantly. And it, it was tough. And I, I don't know if she listens to this, she might be like, that's not true. But I, I don't know. The times I met her, she always wore something that didn't show off this bump. I don't know. I, I, it, I could be wrong, but I used to say, oh, bless her, she's trying to like hide it and as the months progressed I got stronger and I was more able to be around her and then my other best friend got pregnant as well and the joy I felt for her was massive but obviously there was the month where I was like okay I'm not having babies in the same year as you two you know because obviously then I, I skipped that and it became January and um, I didn't know I was so close to conceiving at the time obviously but it was painful and I I I don't feel like I couldn't speak to them because of the stigma that there is around miscarriage, but I feel I personally didn't. Um, and I am a little bit like strange because I can be very open on my social media when I need to be, but then I won't just pick up the phone. Very rarely when I pick up the phone and say I'm having a bad day today. It's something I kind of deal with. Um, but I am more open about it now, way more open about it now. And I think it was after I, I opened up on social media and got connected to so many people, I can and I can do a show like this and I can come and speak about it. I feel like I'm able to talk about it now and be very open about it. And now as well about this, my pregnancy now, the journey, the mental health journey, I'm going on with it too. So I'm, I'd like it to be an open conversation. I'd like women to feel that they can talk about it if they wanted to. You know, it's obviously up to them. New Max Stack Mascara. Stack. 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 But if there's so many, as I said, so many people in the same position, and there is an, an awful lot of us who can't have children at all, and that, again, as you said, is incredibly isolating. Like you, you mentioned, you just touched me there because you mentioned going through your 30s. Okay, we've got the tears coming. <laughs> but if you can't have children at all, you see all of your friends going through that process, and you, you know that's never going to be you. So... It also touches you in that respect. And hearing you say that, you know, my heart just leapt and went, I know what that feels like. But that's also not rare not to be able to have children too. Did you ever feel that, we talked about this, We have. I've talked about this with women before. Did you ever feel a sense of failure? Did you ever feel a sense of judgment as, and people avoiding you because they didn't want to necessarily be around someone who couldn't have children or... I've worked in this field also because I'm a psychotherapist and um, when IVF was le legislated in Malta, um, part of the process was that couples going through IVF had to do um, three sessions of psychotherapy and I worked with Professor Mark Brinkart as his psychotherapist. So I was meeting so many couples who are going through it. Um, and I found that it surprised me because I was very open about it, but most of the couples I met were keeping it a secret, were keeping IVF a secret, were keeping their infertility a secret. And, and I used to probe this and I'd ask them, like, why um, can't you talk about it? Why do you feel that it has to be a secret? And they would say it's no one's business and... Um, Mainly it was stemming from um, a sense of failure, that not living up to society expectations, their own expectations, their family's expectations. And not everyone everyone is understanding. Also, people can be very shaming in, in what they say. Like I've often been told, like, why are you not like by well-meaning but ignorant people in a way? Like, um, 
you know what are you waiting for to have kids you know why are you leaving it so long you don't know if you're going to be able to or look at your friends they all have why are you not having and I mean I used to I remember once being in a restaurant and this grandmother came up to me of a friend of mine and said you know look at she was pregnant at the time she's she's pregnant why are you not getting pregnant and I remember pinching myself so that I don't feel the pain I was trying to take away the pain from my heart but I just couldn't hold it I just burst out crying there and then um, so anyway I think a lot of it is fear of judgment fear of um, being considered a failure because the narrative that we live in is that women will have children or will grow up able to have children so if we tweak that narrative a little bit in some way that it's a personal journey and not everyone's able to it's not automatically expect it's not going to ha- necessarily going to happen it's not Absolutely. the end of the it's not the end for it's not the goal for everyone oh i couldn't have said it but i think that is exactly how i'm glad it's on camera because so I'll, i'll rewatch and read it yeah. because that's, that's exactly what i think needs to happen you know when we're going back to the previous changing topic the of, narrative yeah, of changing what's narrative. expected so when you know that 12 year old girl and a nine year old girl to go i can have kids and i cannot i might not you know i didn't maybe yeah. not nine but 13 14 however old it doesn't have to be and i think we are changing it is moving once you know women have careers and uh, we all are very driven in our careers and all again generalizing but you know it's very different to when our parents were having children and having us and the narrative has started to shift and change and so hopefully people will stop saying stupid things like that and if we're vocal about it maybe people will because even with me and I didn't I didn't try for however long but when you're gonna have now babies eh? you got married now babies or uh, I always used to agree I'd be like, uh-huh, yes. like that and <laughs> even me <laughs> but then you're trying and you know I've got my period that day now babies and I'm like <laughs> I mean, no because I just got my period so maybe not this month you know or um, I had some of those I, I to your question of did you ever feel shame I think it does stem from a sense of shame now historically I don't know where that shame came from like why did why do women the feel shame the goddess of fertility all these yeah sense of shame why can't my body why can't my body hold a baby like you know why did I lose it and I did have I did think of things in my two weeks of lying in my bed I was thinking what did I do wrong you know and then does it come down to something we did wrong No, not necessarily. It's it's a, every every pregnancy is a different journey. Uh, there are uh, let's start from the very beginning. Here we are discussing when women um, are having problems. From my experience, um, not everyone knows when to get pregnant. So um, we sometimes we need to go to that basic. For a lot of people, it might be a very basic information. But there are couples that even do not know when a woman can get pregnant so Mm -hmm. although um, uh, then after a couple of months um, they might get pregnant but um, we need to start from the very basic women and men because we're too in getting pregnant it's not just the woman need to first uh, understand the body as soon and if you are planning to have a baby your body needs to be prepared to have a baby getting pregnant might be easy for some might be more difficult for others so that's something that we also need to but you mentioned planning there so just gonna stop you but you mentioned planning how what what are you doing as a woman to to plan to have a baby first of all you need to understand your cycle uh, it might be very Uh, so a lot of people might know of course I know my cycle I know that I ovulate in this part of my cycle I get my period 14 days after but not everyone knows that so the first thing is that you need to understand your body you need to understand which is, which part of your menstrual cycle you are fertile and which part you're not uh, if you're planning on having a baby try to adapt and change your lifestyle into a, a healthier one uh, make sure that you are uh, ha- healthier have, means what because i'm just going to okay. keep break because i'm not a parent so i'm going to keep breaking this down what does healthier mean healthy means uh, healthy food so try to avoid the junk make sure that you have 
enough nutrition, nutritional value in your food. So uh, if you uh, eat junk food and do not eat vegetables, do not eat fruit, that's not that healthy. So you need to make sure that you're getting your uh, nutrients. Uh, you need to make sure that you start some supplements way in advance. For example, uh, folic acid is a given. I think every woman or at least most women who want to get pregnant uh, start by taking folic acid three months in advance ideally to make sure that um, the baby is uh, to try and avoid um, defects but it's not only folic acid can I just stop you again again because I'm going to put my hand up and say I know nothing about this but what does the folic acid do so folic acid helps uh, to make sure that the neural uh, system uh, in the body uh, is is fine and avoids uh, spina bifida in children okay so that's something that every woman who is planning on getting pregnant should start three months in advance so folic acid 400 micrograms is very simple um, but yes it's very very important it will avoid um, uh, defects uh, in the baby so that's as, uh, namely spina bifida but um, it also helps the woman since folic acid is also a component and helps uh, the, the blood system but apart from folic acid there are also uh, vitamin D is very very important both pre and post uh, conception uh, folic acid helps the immunity helps bone formation there is also iron which is very important uh, so you need to make sure that your food contains iron or else you take a supplement um, that contains iron uh, something else which is very important is exercise um having having <laughs> yes, um keeping uh, an ideal weight and try to avoid being overweight is important um women who are obese uh, might have problems in uh, getting pregnant so try to exercise and ha and uh, uh, keep uh, an ideal weight uh, try to avoid coffees and alcohol a lot of coffees and alcohol they also affect pre um, conception and uh, stress also has its impact and going back to couples not knowing when to conceive uh, that might be stressful because if there is no actual problem to get pregnant but you are doing it at the wrong time you will get your pregnancy tests which are all negative and you might think that there is a problem but it might you build up stress yeah, and, it build up stress, and it might be because uh, you are not tracking your cycle in the correct way then uh, there might be couples and as we are discussing there are couples who even if they're having a very um, healthy lifestyle they're doing everything as it should be and then it's not happening and then it's then it's when it might get a bit more stressful because as far as you are concerned you're doing everything Part as it book, should be yeah. you have you're, you're doing it month after month and you're being very very careful and it's not happening and then it's where you need to f to look for help and it's okay to look for help because it's there there are instances yes that there might be conditions that and uh, not uh, conditions or there might be some kind of problem that might be interfering with getting pregnant but this brings this whole back to right back to the beginning of the conversation where we said you know we as women you as a little girl, you as a, as a newly married wife, assumed that you were going to be a mum. You assumed you were going to be a mum. You assumed, I had always assumed I was going to be a mum. And of course, what you've just illustrated is that it's actually much more complicated than we think it is. And when you mentioned stress, I think everybody around the table went, oh yeah, <laughs> because lives are more stressful than they used to be. And that is reflected in the statistics around the world at the moment that um, fertility rates, fertility rates in, in Malta are dropping, fertility rates in Europe are dropping, fertility Especially in world sperm quality as well with all the contaminants in the air and yeah. in the food. And 
linking to what she said, the sperm quality, as I said before, it's two. two. There's the female and the male. So not only the female needs to prepare the, her body, it's even the male. Um, the male, um, the, the sperm health is very important. So even the, the, the male needs to make sure that he, he's following and he has a healthy lifestyle. Um, try also to take some uh, supplements which contain selenium, zinc, uh, L-arginine and L-carnitine which help uh, the health of the, of the sperm. It improves motility, it improves the hormone levels. So did, I mean, did you guys, did you know this? Did you know that the me your, your husbands had to be taking selenium and all sorts of things. Oh, we didn't well, know what he was had meant to. tried everything. We had <laughs> researched so much as we, as we were trying. I was like, I had this health book, like this um, natural medicine book. Try, okay, Dave, you have to take this. I have to take this. You know, we tried everything to try throughout the years. But probably couples who are initially trying will not, will not, think, of the, will not think of this now. And it seems like such a natural process, doesn't it? Girl meets because guy, they exactly get married, the they have a thing. Your whole life is like, be careful you don't get pregnant. As in, like, as a teenager. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you're I'll just going to... sex, you're going to get pregnant. <laughs> it's just like, as simple as that. Whoop, whoop, we're pregnant. And then, it's not. So. Listen, uh, we're going to call... Come... <laughs> Listen, we're going to bring this towards an end because I... I, I... No, I'm not going to even say that. Listen, I want to just thank you ladies for bringing these thoughts for, for this amazing advice. I'm going to come to each of you just to, to close. First of all, I think everyone at the table, Max, congratulations. Thank you. I'm so excited for you, so uh, for you, you and for Adrian, and we're thrilled. But based on your experience, I mean, your experience now offers hope to other women. I hope so. I'd like it to be that way as well. I'd like it to be a array of hope. Both you spoke so much about miscarriage and here you are with us today expecting your Baby. child so i'm so excited for you, you and absolutely thrilled elena you have shared this great information with us and, the, and all these things that i don't think i had ever heard of <laughs> as, an, as a grown-up i'd never heard about this that men have to prepare themselves as well where is this information available from because i think if for any couple or any woman who's listening to this show maybe she thinks to herself you know i need to find out more. Where, where, where can we find out about this uh, for those couples who are thinking of getting pregnant something that they need to do maybe they speak to their pharmacist speak to their doctor so that the pharmacist or the doctor or their gynae helps them to every as i said before every journey is different everyone is different so ideally the, our point of contact would be a health professional we read a lot of books so there are books that are um peer reviewed let's say so we google a lot maybe google has some good information but ideally we go to our health professional because every individual is different you might be taking some medication you might be suffering from any condition from some condition so ideally you go to your health professional even a pharmacist the pharmacist is the first point of contact so Go to your pharmacist, discuss um, what your plans are. You don't need to feel ashamed if it's not happening because all health professionals are there to help you. So uh, I think that's our point of reference. And Karen, I mean, I, I and I love Max's story. I love your story as well because you're a, a woman who was persistent and but also at, p at peace, but you still eventually had what you wanted and i think it offers hope to so many women that after 15 years of of that journey you you managed to have a family but it also offers hope because you've achieved your peace before you had that as well i i would like to say that if your dream is to become a parent um don't give up hope is what's going to give you the courage to keep on trying there is help most if you want to become a parent there is there are so many different ways whether it's assisted um conception if that's the problem if it's um, adoption surrogacy there are so many different options that can help you achieve your desire to be a parent um if your body is not cooperating but um 
and also to if you have no one to talk to if for instance you can't talk about it with your partner but you know not everyone is easy to talk to or if you um, don't have someone to talk to there are people who can help there are support groups there are um, therapists um, it's when you're going through infertility there are so many difficult emotions to live through there's anger there's um, anxiety there's um, isolation there's despair there's hope there's the constant I know it's a cliche but it really is a roller coaster journey because you're high low high low high low and this takes its toll on the body so even after the child is born you, you sometimes you can be more susceptible to postnatal depression because of the trauma you've been through in getting there so it's really important to be able to um, talk to somebody some healthcare professional to help you through the handle the emotions because the one thing you can't do is bottle them up inside because if you bottle them up inside all an emotion wants is to be experienced and released once you release it once you live it once you let it have its time then it's gone so but if you store it in if you don't talk about it then it's gonna um it's going to be in your um you're going to store it somewhere and you're going to suffer the physical consequences of storing that emotion because it takes a lot of energy to store emotions and to hold things in and um there are techniques you can use to to help you experience these emotions and to talk about them um I so, have to bounce off that if I may I know you want course. to close no, off no, go ahead. um oh, but sorry. we went back to um to talking about it and I really have to stress that because I opened up on social media because I came on the show with Trudy and I'm here again and I recently posted that we are expecting even though I was petrified to do so because again celebrating what if something happens there was a lot of um um, vulnerability, like a vulnerable, vulnerability hangover I had the next day because I was like, oh gosh, I've just shared this big news. And But if I hadn't been connected to so many women who had similar stories and who went through so much, some of which got over it re- relatively quickly, some of which mourned the loss of their child 20 years on, I would not have I don't think I'd be in a space that I am now. I don't think I would have had that hope because I would have lived in a grieving period for much, much longer. I would have felt very isolated, very alone because I wouldn't have spoken to anybody. It would have just been all my pain and my story and my journey alone. Well, obviously with Adrian, but alone. Um, and then I, I really feel that all those women who spoke to me and Thank God they did because they just offered so much hope. And it is really the one thing that I think you need to cling on even right now with all the anxiety that builds up between scams. Hope gives before. you courage. Hope gives you courage and other women can give you courage also. And I think it's, I would I would encourage anyone to speak. Now, I don't mean you have to go and shout it from the hilltops, but like you said, and both of you said, you know, healthcare professionals, I have to say I'm seeing um, an amazing, amazing nurse at... Um, midwife and and counselor and she's everything all rolled into one at the perinatal clinic in Matadei, which is just fantastic and she's been offering so much support so much help not to feel alone through this different journey so i can't imagine doing this on my own so i'm really grateful to everyone who reached out to me and i just encourage anyone going through something to reach out to someone and i think a healthcare provider is, is probably the best bet well, this is why we decided to do the she word, because we wanted to talk about, have these conversations that women don't have and encourage women to reach out to others, support each other and empower each other. And thank you so much to each of you for being here, to empower, thank to you for share having us. and to be able to encourage other women in the same position. Thank you so much. My morning starts here with an experience that's unforgettable, a precise roast and a generous crema. Taste the unforgettable espresso.